wasn't until I lost my sight that I saw the need to have Jesus in my life. I was working hard and I had an idea of what I wanted to do and what I wanted to accomplish, but I was spinning my wheels. I wasn't getting anywhere. The harder I worked and strived to do something, the farther it got away from my reach, farther it got away from me. I was on a journey but had no way to go. I, I felt like I was in the middle of an ocean in a rowboat, rowing, 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 and never getting anywhere. The lowest point in my life came in my junior year of high school. My mom and stepfather were getting divorced. I lost my grandfather who had basically raised me. He was my dad. He was the closest thing I had to a father in my life at that time. I felt totally alone. I turned to drinking and that's how I tried to solve the problem. The accident that took my eyesight was, was the biggest turning point for me. It was God reaching out and getting my attention. You know, we were going down the freeway, I got ran off the freeway, and the ensuing crash crushed my face and threw me out of the car. And I had no idea what had happened. I just knew that I was hurt. And as I tried to get up, I heard a voice say, do you want to live or die? Immediately, I raised my hand up and said, I want to live. And I felt a hand on the back of my neck and the small of my back, and I got laid in the fetal position. And that's the last thing I remember from that until waking up in the hospital eight days later. And then it all became evident that I'd lost my eyesight. Got out of the hospital and I, I was a bowler. I had a 215 average and that's what I wanted to do was try to bowl again. So totally blind, we went to the bowling alley. I strapped on my shoes, grabbed the ball out of the bag. They turned the lane on for me. And the first ball I threw was a strike. And at that point, I had faith that everything was gonna be good. And that was probably my first steps back to Jesus. It took God taking my eyesight to allow me to see the path of where I needed to be. It was the end of the long journey from where I was before as nothing but a pitiful sinner living every day for myself to growing to where I could start living to be something special for Jesus. My dad had been constantly pulling me back to the Word, back to Jesus. Ever since the car wreck, one thing led to another and our relationship began to bloom and grow. Whenever we would go up and visit in Kansas City, we'd always go to church with him. And he had a knack of finding preachers. We weren't really following any church. We looked for churches here in the Houston area, but never found that one we could connect with. So my dad kept encouraging us to listen to Pastor Phil. He would send us the link every week. We wouldn't do it, we wouldn't do it. And then finally, the Lord led me to Daniel. That was the first day that Pastor Phil started the Daniel series. And that told me again, just like getting that strike bowling that time, everything is gonna be right. This is where you need to be. Since that date and that last February, Candace and I have watched every week here at home did our Next Steps class, and we joined the church. It was right after that that we decided, let's get baptized. When I came up out of the water, I felt lighter than air. I felt like I was walking but not touching the ground. It was the greatest feeling I've ever had. With God anchoring us now, we talk about Jesus openly. I've started praying daily now. I'm reading the Bible daily, and I'm becoming a friend with God. The way I've reached out and grown is by providing services for the blind, for the visually impaired community. So I'm constantly trying to bring the blind in and let them know that they have value, there is a place for them, and that God loves them. What I see is way past the everyday duality of humanism. It's on to the faith of Jesus and what I can do to better serve my Lord.
So good to see you, Abundant Life. We're in 2 Thessalonians today, the book of 2 Thessalonians. If you've just joined us for the first time, we like to go through books of the Bible line by line, and that's what we're doing now. We've been through 1 Thessalonians. We're going to start 2 Thessalonians, the second letter the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Thessalonica, this ancient wisdom that is so relevant to the days in which we live. I want to say thank you to Dale Campbell for sharing your story, Dale. Praise be to God, church. Aren't you thankful for Dale's story? He says, I'm learning to be a friend of God. Dale, I am so thankful to say you're a friend of Pastor Phil. It is a joy to know you. And here's what I find so amazing about his story. God had to take his sight to give him vision. He can see more now than he ever could before. And you understand what I've been praying for, that today God would do that very same thing. Anyone today, under the sound of my voice, wherever you are, I pray that God would give you vision, that he might not take your healthy set of eyes, that, that you would have vision to see what you need to see, not just physically, but spiritually, to see what you need eternally. Because the reality is this, the Apostle Paul would write in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 that if our gospel is veiled, if the good news is hidden, it is hidden to them that are perishing, in whose mind the God of this age, that Satan, has blinded the mind of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel can shine unto them. For many, many years, it was Dale's eyes that were blinded, the eyes of his mind and when God finally took his sight, he could finally see. And church, there's some things that some of us need to see. And I'm praying that today that God would give sight to the blind. And that's what we're going to see today as the Apostle Paul opens up the second letter to Thessalonians. We've called this church the church of irresistible influence. They're like the model church, something we should all aspire to be. The church of irresistible influence. Their reputation went far beyond their region. This was a church of irresistible faith and hope and love. A church that stood for truth. A church that was known for their love. And a church that was the voice of hope. And we're going to see today that they had this faith that God called worthy. The Thessalonians were known by God for being irresistibly worthy of the kingdom of God. Now, I don't know about you, but I want God to count me worthy of the kingdom, yes? And we're going to see what made them worthy is they had a faith that was truly costly. Let's pick it up now. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 1. Paul and his ministry companions, Silvanus and Timothy. To the church of the Thessalonians, in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, we are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly and the love of every one of you all abounds toward each other. So that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure, which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may, here it is, be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. What do we see? That God counts a faith that is suffering worthy. Here's the reality. A faith that is truly worthy is a faith that is truly costly. You see, in the eyes of God, a faith that demands nothing, costs nothing, does nothing, is worth nothing. And Paul now commends the Thessalonians. We are watching a church in the early days of Christianity going through intense persecution, intense tribulation. But you understand, while Satan tempts, it is God who tests. And the very things in your life, the hard things, the painful things, the difficult things that Satan hopes will ruin your faith are the very things that God wants to use to reveal your faith. See, faith cannot be ruined, it can only be refined. And it's in the trials of life, the hard times of life, that God is revealing your faith while Satan is hoping to ruin your faith. And I want you to see that what we're learning is that a faith that suffers nothing is worth nothing because it's not true faith. It might be a faith of the intellect, it might be a faith that's pure emotion, but it's not true saving faith. And you learn in scripture there's different kinds of faith. There's what James chapter two calls saving faith, and then there is dead faith that can bring no life. You see, God counted the Thessalonians worthy because their faith was truly costly. It was a faith that cost them deeply, it cost them dearly. Many of them were dying a martyr's death for no other reason than that way they were Christians. But here 
here's what we're learning. In the fire of life's trials, true faith is refined, false faith is ruined. Every once in a while, I hear a story of somebody uh, like Dale who went through a horrible tragedy and a horrible situation, but unlike Dale, they hardened their heart toward God, they walked away from God, and somebody says, Phil, they lost their faith. No, here's the reality. Faith can't be lost. True saving faith can't be lost. See, those things only reveal your faith, the kind of faith. And what we're learning is that difficult times, painful times, times of suffering and trial and tribulation, God wants to use them to refine them. And the reality is that it can be ruined if it was never truly saving faith. And this is what I want you to do today. I want you to take a faith test. I want you to self-examine your kind of faith. And that's what Paul says today we should do. 2 Corinthians 13, 5, the apostle Paul would write these words. It says, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves, do you not know that yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you are disqualified. Here's what Paul says. We need to have a little self-introspection, a little self-examination, testing ourselves to see if we're really in the faith. And I want you to know what it means. It means we're not supposed to like right now think, man, I wish so-and-so was here to hear this sermon. Like they need this sermon. <laughs> no, the reality is Paul's writing, you need this sermon. I need this sermon. We all need to have a little self-examination. Test ourselves whether we really be in the faith. Because the reality is we live at a time where many of us think we're in the faith, but it's not true saving faith. In other words, they profess Christ, but they don't really possess Christ. There are many who have been baptized but never really born again. They say they're Christians, but they've never become 2 Corinthians 5, 17, a new creation. They've never really gone through conversion, what the Bible calls a regeneration. So consequently, they have a false faith of the intellect, meaning they believe about God. We understand believing about God is not the same as knowing God. Believing about Jesus is not the same as trusting in Jesus. And that's why today we're going to have a little test, self-examination. Am I really in the faith? And the reason why, church, listen carefully, we are all closer to eternity than we think. There is a doorway to eternity. What is this? This is this door right here. This door, not literally, but figuratively, is the doorway to eternity, of which one day we will all pass through this doorway into eternity, meaning you will close your eyes in time and you will open up the eyes on the other side of this doorway. And I want you to know today, you will eventually see whatever is on the other side of that door personally. There's gonna come a day, your heart's gonna beat one last time. Your breath is gonna come one last time. Your lungs are gonna fill up one last time in this dimension known as time. And you're gonna pass through this door into eternity. And there was a time back in the 1990s, I don't know if you guys know this or not, but I was a SWAT cop with KCPD. And my job literally was getting through doors that were locked and bolted. And I was really good at it. My job was the ram man. I had the battering ram and I'd come running up there and bam, it was so much fun. <laughs> I was good at it. You know, once in a while, door was really locked. It was bolted down. I have to hit it again. Bam. Oh, it was so much fun, right? But I want you to know something. Listen carefully. This door into eternity is not locked. It's not bolted. I'm trying to tell you, you are closer than you think. It's unlocked, and it's already standing wide open. You see, the moment you were born, you were destined to die. And a lot of us think, Phil, I don't need to think about this yet. I'm 25 years old. I'm years away from having to think about this. I'm 35. All I can do is just keep up with my toddlers, really. No, listen very carefully. You're already in the threshold of the door. You are one heartbeat away. You are one breath away. And it's not a door that is bolted. It's a thin, thin veil. It is a thin, thin veil that separates you right now from time, stepping through that door into eternity, which is why we need to examine ourselves as to whether we're really in the faith. Do you have mere religion or do you have real redemption? And they're not the same thing. And I want you to know today that, listen very carefully, the fire of today cannot compare to the fire Jesus will bring someday. That's what I like about preaching through books of the Bible. You don't get to cherry pick all the happy parts. 
No, when you preach line by line through the Bible, like I like to, you get to go through all the hard parts too. Today is a hard part. Today is a hard message. It's not my message. I didn't write it. I'm merely reporting it. This is the word of God written by the Apostle Paul, a man of God under the inspiration of the Spirit of God to both woo us and warn us. Because this early church was going through great fire of affliction, fire of persecution, fire of tribulation. Today is the day as a child of God where the hard times of life are the refiner's fire. But God, Paul is promising that one day Jesus is coming and when he does, he's bringing fire with him. But it will not be refiner's fire, it's going to be judgment fire on all those that have rejected him, on all those that have rejected God's gracious offer and invitation of salvation and redemption. Look at what he writes here in verse six. Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. You understand what we're learning here? Listen carefully. What we're learning is the gospel is good news to those who believe, but friends, it is bad news to those who don't. <laughs> See, it's a two-sided coin. The, 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 the gospel, that, that word means good news. But to imply there's good news is also to imply there is bad news. And it's good news for those who believe it and obey it. What is the gospel? The good news is that while we are separated from God because of our sin, he is holy and we are not. It was the sinless son of God who came like the sons of men to die for our sin. Three days later, he rose again so that we can be forgiven and become like him. That's good news. We've been reconciled to God who is holy, though we are not. But listen very carefully. If Jesus will not pay penalty of sin for you, then you will one day pay your sin's penalty yourself. That's the good news, bad news. Romans 6.23 puts it this way. The good news and the bad news all in one verse. The gospel all in one verse. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. That's what's at stake. Today is the day to choose, life or death. It was on that Oklahoma, not Oklahoma, but Houston Highway on the side of that interstate. You heard the story, Dale Campbell is lying there and he is hurt, he's fighting for his life. He says, I hear a voice, do you want to live or die? I know what voice that was, it was the voice of the Holy Spirit. Do you want to live or die? And that is still the voice of the Holy Spirit alive today, asking you the same question. Do you want to live or die? Life or death? The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. There is coming a day, and it may be sooner than you think, that you're gonna walk through this doorway into eternity, and it will instantly either be eternal life or eternal death. Today is the day to choose life. Instead of death, cross over that line from death into life. Because the simple reality is this, when you reject God's grace, all that's left is God's wrath. Now I realize this thought makes a lot of us really squirmy. You know why? Because we've been so conditioned by modern American society to see God as just that doting grandfather in the sky Winking at our sin. He's a God of love. And it's all pastels and roses. And I'm happy to say that God is, in fact, a God of love. God is love. But did you know that for every one verse in the Bible on the love of God, there are seven verses in the Bible on the holiness of God? He's a holy God. 
And you see the fact that he's holy, that means sinless, that means righteous. It means he is a just judge and he must assess a penalty for our sin. If he did not assess a penalty for our sin, he wouldn't be a just judge, he would be corrupt. That's called corruption if he looked the other way. And so consequently, he has to assess a penalty. And check out what it says in Romans chapter one and verse 16, it says this, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. See, what we learn in Romans 1 is not that people don't have the truth, it's that they suppress the truth. And Romans 1.20 says, God has already given them some truth so that if they would respond to that truth, God would give them more truth till they had enough truth to receive Jesus Christ the way, the truth, and the life. The promise problem is they are suppressing the truth. Amen. Instead of saying yes to the truth, and God is a God of grace and truth. And John chapter one twice tells us Jesus was a man full of grace and truth. If you're not coming to the truth, you're not under the grace of God, you're under the judgment of God and the wrath of God. He must assess a penalty for sin. Now somebody says, Phil, whoa, 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 wait wait a minute now. You're gonna get a little theological, a little philosophical. You hear people do this all the time. Like God is a God of love. There's no way God would send innocent people to hell. 100% right. 100% accurate. God will not send innocent people to hell. The problem is there are no innocent people. Romans 3.10 says, we have all sinned. There is none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. See, today God wants to take the blinders from off your eyes. The reason you think you deserve heaven is because you don't know who God is, and only once you know who God is can you know who you are, and only once you see God for what he is can you see yourself for what you are. There's not one among us that is innocent, Oh, wait a minute, good people go to heaven. No, wait a minute, good is not the standard of heaven. Perfection is the standard of heaven. And I'm sure compared to most people, you're a good person, maybe even a great person. But that's the wrong standard. Heaven is a place of perfection. You see, you're comparing yourself to the wrong person. You can always find somebody you're gooder than. I'm gooder than them, I'm gooder than them, I'm gooder than them, I'm gooder than them. But be careful, because you can always find somebody gooder than you too. See, the point is no one is as good as God. In fact, Jesus said in Matthew 19, no one is good except for God. He's trying to show us that not one among us is innocent of sin and deserving of heaven. People say, well, I cannot believe a loving God would send people to hell. You know what the bigger question is? How can a holy God let anybody go to heaven? That's the bigger miracle, that's the bigger question, that's the bigger mystery. See, today is the day of salvation. Today is God's gracious invitation to come to Jesus. Romans 10, 13, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved, saved from sin's penalty. But if you will not receive the grace of God, you put yourself automatically under the judgment of God and the wrath of God. You see, it's good news for those who believe. It is bad news for those who do not, for those who reject the gospel. God will bring everlasting destruction on them for their sin and for their rebellion. And that's what the Apostle Paul writes to the Thessalonians. And on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord. So you don't need a PhD in divinity and doctorate of theology to understand the Bible. People say, well, it's just a mystery. I don't know what that means. No, wait a minute. The Bible's easy to understand. It's just sometimes hard to believe. When it contradicts what you want to believe. And God loves us enough to tell us the truth, to warn us in hopes of wooing us. Life or death, you choose. And it couldn't be more clear. This same Jesus, full of grace and truth, that came from heaven when he was here, talk more about hell than he did about heaven. In fact, if you read the words in red, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and all the words recorded of Jesus, you will find, go ahead and count this up this afternoon. For every verse, Jesus talked about heaven. There are four verses he talked about hell. And people like to say, well, hell is just allegorical. I mean, hell is just metaphorical. No, Jesus wasn't telling us four times more about a literal heaven with an allegorical hell. 
You don't get a literal heaven and an allegorical hell. It's either all true or none of it's true. Either you believe Jesus or you don't. This is why he came. Look at what Jesus said in Matthew 25, 46. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Well, wait a minute. It's, it's, it's metaphorical when we talk about punishment, but it's literal when we talk about life. Seriously? And is that what you're going with? I would suggest we take Jesus the way he meant it. There is eternal life and there is eternal death. There's an eternal heaven and there is an eternal hell. And you can't have one that's literal and another just metaphorical. We live at a time of something called Christian universalism. I'm telling you, Jesus warned about false teachers and there are more false teachers alive today in the churches of America than maybe any other time in church history. And one of the false theologies of many false teachers is something called Christian universalism. What is universalism? It is a theology that says, in the end, everybody goes to heaven. Doesn't matter what you believe, what God you serve, in the end, everybody goes to heaven. All roads lead to heaven. All religions get there. Christian universalism is the ultimate oxymoron. Like It's like saying Christian cocaine. There is no such thing. The scripture could not be more clear. Jesus himself comparing, contrasting, eternal life, eternal death. There's coming a day that you're gonna walk through the threshold of eternity. You're gonna take your step out of time with one last breath and one last tick of your heart. And when you get to the other side of this door, you're either going to be condemned in eternal death and destruction or eternal love and eternal light. And today is the day to choose. Today would be the day. I love, by the way, how modern science eventually catches up to the Bible. Did you know that modern astrophysicists have actually coined a term for what the Bible calls eternity? You can YouTube this. You can read about this. These are not Bible-believing people. They are modern scientists that actually have measured something they're calling the fifth dimension. The fifth dimension is a scientific term for what Jesus called eternity, another dimension. We currently live in a three-dimensional space of height, width, and depth. Time is the fourth dimension. Now, they have measured something out there somewhere called the fifth dimension. Did you know that 85% of the matter in the universe can't be found? Scientists know it's there. They can weigh it, but they just can't find it. Like they can measure it, but they just can't see it. They call it dark matter. We don't know what it is. It's there. We can't see it. I know what it is. Heaven and hell is a real place. It's real matter. It is not a metaphysical existence. Remember what Jesus said in John 14. I go to prepare a place for you. This time, you know, they talk about portals and bending time. Like, you think this is science fiction. This is new, modern science. Astrophysicists actually talking about it. There is a portal from time into eternity, but that portal is not a place. It is a person. Guess what Jesus said in John 10? I am the doorway to eternal life. He is the door. And if you want to step through that doorway into the fifth dimension known as eternity, you must go through the door of the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. He says, anyone that believeth in me, though he may die, yet shall he live. That's good news for those who believe on him and trust in him. Not simply believing about him. Believing about him is mere religion. Knowledge will not bring your salvation. James chapter two, even the demons believe and tremble. Just knowing theology will not save you. Well, knowing theology is not enough to save you from sin's penalty. Has there been a moment in your life that you knew you were separated from God, that no, you can't get to heaven by being a good person, and you're not innocent of sin, and because of that, you need redemption. That is not religion, that's redemption. That is God's gracious offer of salvation. Jesus said in Mark 9, 44, hell, it's where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Hmm, what does he mean by that? Only theologians can debate this stuff. 
says, their worm does not die. He's speaking of a condition of being eternally dead, yet never ceasing to exist. This is not the doctrine of annihilationism. You have much heresy going on in modern Christianity, Christian universalism, annihilationism. Like if you don't go to heaven, you just cease to exist. Not what Jesus taught. Couldn't be more clear, Revelation 14, 11, and the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. No, you're going to live eternally somewhere. You're going to live forever somewhere. Either eternal life or eternal destruction. And today is the day of salvation. And some say, well, you know, Phil, I, I, there's no way I'm going to die and go to hell because my life is a living hell. No, listen carefully. Your life is not hell. Your life may be hard, but it's not hell. Hell is hell. And the fires of life today cannot compare to the fire that will be. Today is the day to receive the good news, the gospel of salvation. Jesus gave a stern warning. Listen, I'm simply preaching back to you the words of Jesus. I'm not the, the one who wrote the message. I'm simply the messenger. I'm simply reporting what Jesus said. Look at what he said in Mark 3, 28. Assuredly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven, the sons of men, and whatever blasphemies they may utter, but he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiven forgiveness, but is subject to eternal condemnation. Jesus was trying to warning many of us here under the sound of my voice, any sin can be forgiven except the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. So what is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? Very common question. Phil gets it often. Phil, I'm afraid I have blasphemed the Holy Spirit. Well, what do you mean? Well, I took the Lord's name in vain and I cussed and I'm afraid I blasphemed, you know, the Holy Spirit. No, listen carefully. That is not the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit or your pastor would be dead. I've been honest over the, uh, my besetting sin, okay? Every once in a while, one slips out. does for you too. One more example of how nobody here is innocent. You've cussed. Don't sit there like you're all self-righteous. I've cussed. You've cussed. I need forgiveness from God or I'd be dead. The wages of sin is death. You do too. The blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is not taking the Lord's name in vain. No, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is when you willfully, with your eyes wide open, reject the gracious offer of salvation made possible through the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus spoke those words to the Pharisees, the religious leaders of his days, and he was saying to them, listen, you are rejecting me, the promised Messiah. You are doing it with your eyes wide open. No, the problem is not that you don't have the truth. The problem is that you are suppressing the truth. And the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is when you've heard the gospel over and over again, and you've heard the good news over and over again. You've heard that Jesus died for your sin and rose again. He offers this invitation of salvation, but you have rejected over and over again God's gracious offer of salvation. Eventually, you you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, meaning you have resisted the Spirit of God one too many times. You have crossed a line, and there's no going back then. And only God knows when you've crossed the line. He doesn't owe you more than one opportunity, one invitation. Now, in his grace, he might give you many, many, many opportunities, but there's a point where you resist the Spirit of God one too many times. You cross the line, and there is no going back. And you die in your sin, and Jesus said, you are destined for eternal condemnation. There's no hope of salvation. Somebody says, Phil, I'm afraid I've crossed the line. I'm not sure. Maybe I blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Maybe I'm no longer redeemable. No, listen very carefully. If you're still listening to me, you have not blasphemed the Holy Spirit. Because if you have blasphemed the Holy Spirit, you're not listening anymore. You've done turned me off. I ain't listening to this guy. I'm done. 
You've either turned off the computer, you've turned off the TV screen, or maybe you're sitting in here and you just haven't walked out yet, but you've turned me off. See, you've hardened your heart toward God. That's the mark of the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. No, if you're still leaning in and you're still listening and you're still examining yourself about your own destination, it is not too late for you. You have not blasphemed the Holy Spirit, but today is the day of salvation because if you delay, if you say no one more time, you don't know, but there is a point where you cross the line. Three times in Romans chapter one, God says, I gave them over, I gave them over, I gave them up. There is a point where God gives you what you want. You want a life apart from God? God says, okay, I give you what you want. A life apart from God. Do you understand that's what hell is? It is separated forever from the presence of God. God gives you up. Have it your way. Because the reality is you don't come to faith in the Son of God apart from the Spirit of God. Jesus said, no one comes to me except my Father in heaven draw him. And it's the ministry of the Spirit of God to draw people to the Son of God. And it's called the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit because you have resisted the Spirit of God instead of saying yes to the Spirit of God and putting your faith in the Son of God. It happens one too many times. You cross the line. You blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Eternal condemnation. There's no going back. Today is the day, and I am praying that God would, re- would reveal your true condition, that he would redeem you from the self-deception that I'm a good person, so I'm going to heaven. I'm innocent. I mean, I could never go to hell. No, the reality is none of us are good in the eyes of God. None of us are innocent for all his sin, and that means we are desperate for redemption. Every single one of us. But today, if you say no, You are gambling, playing Russian roulette with your own soul. I've watched it happen. So back in the 90s, when I was a police officer, listen, I was looking for my one before I even knew that's what we called it. And I would share the gospel with whoever I could. I was trying to be a light even then in the darkness. And I was a sergeant. I had a young young officer that worked for me. And we began talking every night. In between 911 calls during our shift, we talk about Jesus. He was far from God, wasn't raised Christian, didn't know anything about it, but began to really inquire, honestly, seeking the truth, seeking, asking. We spent hours talking about the gospel. I'd answer his questions. This went on for several weeks. One night he rolls up to me, pulls up next to me, windows go down, it's winter time. And we start talking about Jesus again. And and I finally look at him and said, Bryce, you know everything you need to know now to receive Jesus. Honestly, there's, there's not that much left to talk about. You know what you need to do. And I watched the Spirit of God get all over him. I mean, tangibly, physically. It's wintertime outside. It is not hot. But he begins to break in to a bead of sweat. And tears are rolling down his face. And I'm watching him squirm, literally, in the police car, in his seat. Like the conviction of God is all over him. He was so close. So close. Bryce, you know what you need to do. Tonight's the night. He says, Sergeant Hopper, I'm not ready. No, not tonight. He rolls up his window, puts the car in drive, and I saw him drive off into the darkness of the night. The next day I come back to work and everything has changed. He doesn't want to talk about it anymore, he's done. We never had another conversation about Jesus after that night. God gave him a window of opportunity. That window closed. He blasphemed the Holy Spirit. I watched it happen. A year later, I had left the police department to pastor this little church that would become Abundant Life, and I heard he'd gotten a shooting. He'd got shot to pieces. He'd got shot like four or five times on duty. 
he was over at KU Med Center, I thought for sure this has got to be the moment. I mean, if this isn't it, what will be? So I drove over to KU Med Center, pay him a visit. He's in the hospital. He's lying there in his hospital bed, shot to pieces. I thought for sure he's going to be ready. He didn't want to talk about it. He'd crossed a line. I can tell you coming back from school, 1989, 21 years of age, I'd wrestled with God, I was running from God, I had resisted the Spirit of God, and I had one more opportunity. I knew in my heart, this is the last time. I got run off the road by an 18-wheeler semi in the very same way Dale Campbell found Jesus at the end of a collision on the side of the interstate. I find Jesus underneath an 18-wheeler semi, and I knew this is the last time. I had better pick up or I'm gonna cross the line and I'm trying to tell you there is coming a day for every person here. We will stand on the threshold of life or death eternally. And when you least expect it, you don't know. Next thing you know, you're gonna be on the other side. And for some of us instantly leaving time for eternity, we will be immersed in the most amazing beauty before the throne of God and that beautiful rainbow that surrounds the throne of God and that river of life flowing from the throne of God and the most perfect love we have ever experienced, the stress and the strain of life will cease. No more tears, no more trials, no more pain, no more death. Yes, you're gonna see your loved ones there that have gone before you in Christ, but then you're gonna see Jesus and it's gonna be the most amazing moment we cannot even imagine, we can't yet really fathom, but this I know, it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One look on his dear face, all trials will erase, so boldly run the race till we see Christ eternal life forever and ever and ever and ever. No more tears, no more suffering, no more sadness. The curse of sin is forever over, it's abolished. But for others, it will not be light, it will be darkness, darkness. Jesus said in Matthew 25, outer darkness where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, I almost made it, I almost, I almost, I almost. Forever and ever, solitary confinement in outer darkness, the presence of God removed. And today is the day to choose. And the way you prepare to walk through the door of eternal life is by letting Jesus walk through the door of your life. That's how you do this. There is a doorway into eternity and there's a doorway into your life and you're the only one that controls the door. Will you let him in? Revelation 3.20, behold, Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me today. He's knocking on the door of your heart. If so, Paul writes, therefore, we also pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling. I have prayed for you this week that God would count you worthy of this calling. As he counted the Thessalonians worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you, in you in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. To God, there is only one thing 
that makes you worthy of eternal life. The shed blood of the Son of God. You are worthy, not because you're so awesome, but because Jesus is so awesome. You're worthy, not because you will ever be sinless and holy, but because Jesus is sinless and holy. And one day, you're going to see him, and then you're going to be just like him. What makes you worthy in the eyes of God? is when he sees the blood of the Son of God. Would you say yes to Jesus? Would you bow with me, every head bowed, every eye closed, wherever you're watching in the world, whatever church house, other campuses here in the Kansas City area, right here in Lee Summit, I've asked you to self-examine that God would redeem you from self-deception. That today God would give sight to the blind on the side of that Houston highway, Dale Campbell hears a voice, do you want to live or die? And today, that same voice asks us all, do you want to live or die? And today, if you know emphatically, absolutely, if you cross through that threshold, that door into eternity, that you are 100% ready, that you have placed your faith personally in the shed blood of the cross of Calvary, you know your destiny, you know what you would see, no doubt in your mind, you have placed your faith in Jesus. I'm gonna ask you to raise up your hand high right now. Hold up your hand to the heaven, would you? Every hand up. If you know for sure today, no games with God, he knows at every campus, in every church house, if you know emphatically my destiny, just hold up your hand high in the air. You may put your hands down. Somebody today would say, Phil, honestly, I cannot put my hand up if I'm gonna be honest. And it all begins with honesty. And I'm gonna ask you right now, if you don't know today, if you died, what you would see, just raise your hand, would you? And whatever campus you're at, whatever church house right here in Lee Summit, if you do not know today what would happen if you died and you passed through that doorway into eternity, just hold up your hand high. I want to pray for you in just a moment. Right now, just hold up your hand, would you? Right now. Just stick them up. Can't see you at the other campuses. God does. He sees you. That's all that matters. The sweet friends, listen, today is the day. We're going to settle up. We're going to make certain. And so I'm going to count to three. And if you're at another campus, your campus pastor is already at the platform. Church house leaders, I want you to stand up and be prepared to minister the gospel to those who you lead right here in Lee Summit. I'm going to be coming off this platform right here. And when I count to three, I want you to get up out of your chair. I want you to come meet me right here at this platform. And we're going to pray. And we're going to settle this issue once and for all. Tonight, when you go to bed, you're going to know that if you woke up in eternity, where you would be. Hold up your hand high right now, I'm gonna count. Response team, I want you to come. One, two, three. Come very, very quickly. I want you all to stand. I want you to pray for those right now that are coming. And I wanna meet you right here, right now. And pray for those that aren't sure. Jesus, I thank you that you have given us the security, the guarantee through what you did at Calvary. And I pray that today the eyes of many would be open. Lord, you would bind the God of this age that blinds people's minds, that the light of the gospel would shine in Jesus' name. You come quickly today. Just walk this way. Church, give them a hand, would you, as they come. We are so thankful.